A very good morning to all my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful to have this privilege to be able to stand before you once more this morning. I think, if I look out from here, I think most of us will remember back to the 70s in a very popular song of the time, Knowing Me, Knowing You. If I remember correctly, I think the group was ABBA. But what I want us to ponder is, what does it mean to know somebody? You know, if I look down from here, uh, I think I know everybody's name. I would recognize you. I would probably know a little bit about you. But uh, I have to confess, honestly, I actually know very little about any of you. I don't know much about what makes you tick. I don't know what your worries and your stresses might be. I don't know what brings you joy and happiness. And... Um, so my confession is that in reality, I don't know any of you very well at all. If we think about the TV soapiest survivor, to outwit, to outlast, and to outplay, I think it was. And yes, it certainly brought up the worst of people. But to, to be successful in that game, you'd have to know who your opponents are, who the other competitors are in the game to know their strategy, to know how they think, to know them as a person. But what happens if it wasn't a million dollars that was at stake at the end of the game? What happens if it was something far bigger than a million dollars or a million rand or whatever the prize pot might be? Who watched that, that epic movie, uh, Hunger Games, very few of you. Okay, you don't have to know. To me, it was a really epic movie. So what happens if truly knowing somebody becomes a matter of life or death? If truly knowing somebody becomes a matter of life or death? Because I want you to consider this verse that we read this morning. It's John 17 and it's verse 3. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Because that is a reality, isn't it? It's life eternal that's at stake. If we don't know God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I suppose if we had to stop and ask most people in the world, well, who is God? What is his name? I think most people would turn around and say, it's God. Isn't God his name? Well, we know differently, don't we? That is not his name. If we go back to the book of Exodus, remember very clearly that Moses had been called by God to be the chosen person to lead that slave nation of Israel out of Egypt. And we can just imagine the huge responsibility that he had on his shoulders. And he felt very unqualified for the task, just as I'm sure any of us would feel. He knew that when he went to speak to the people, they would want to know the identity of this God that was promising them freedom from bondage. And I suppose if you think about it, it's a fair question, isn't it? And it's a fair request by Moses of God. Remember, the people were, were surrounded in Egypt by a multitude of different gods, all the different Egyptian gods. So which of these gods is going to be the one that is going to lead us out of Egypt? And so in Exodus 3, verse 13, we read, Moses said to God, if I go to the Israelites and tell them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Well, what should I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said in reply, you must say to the Israelites, I am, he sent me to you. You might think, well, I am is a rather strange name. You see, I think it was very important that God emphasized exactly his existence as the one true and living God that's against all the different gods of the Egyptians. It suggests for us a God who is now, a God who has always existed and a God who will always exist. 
but we know that those Hebrew words, I am, Asher, I am, or I am that I am, or more accurately rendered, I will be who I will be. But God doesn't stop there. He goes on in verse 15 and says, God also said to Moses, we must say this to the Israelites, the Lord God of your fathers, Yahweh Elohim, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial from generation to generation. Yahweh Elohim, this is my name. So clearly, based on what we've read in John 17, if life eternal is what is at stake, then the knowledge of the Lord, a knowledge of God's name and of his eternal purpose is vitally important, isn't it? But how do we get this right? How do we understand? Well, you see, Moses also struggled with the same thought during that great wilderness journey. And eventually, he pleads with God, much later in Exodus 33, to explain these things. And the record in Exodus 33, verse 12 says, See, you have been saying to me, bring this people up. But you have not, not let me know whom you will send with me. But you said, I know you by name. And also you said, you have found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your way. That I may know you. That I may continue to find favor in your sight. See, that was Moses' request of God. Show me your way that I might know you. And I think that's a request for each one of us, that God might show us his way that we might truly know him. And the record continues in verse 18. Moses said, show me your glory. Yahweh said, I will make all the goodness pass before your face. I will proclaim Yahweh by name before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And verse 20 says, but you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. I'm pretty sure if we think about it, Moses asking to be shown the glory of God. What did he have in mind at the time? But I'm pretty sure that it would have been a witness of the demonstration of that awesome power, the majesty of God Almighty. Probably something like it's seen at the burning bush. But instead, he's given a description of that wonderful character of Yahweh. That Moses might really know him. And so we pick up the record in Exodus 34. Verse 5, we read, And Yahweh descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed by before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will know about and by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children into the third and to the fourth generation. If we ever stop when we read those words to just imagine what it must have been like to be in Moses' shoes, to be standing there and to have that name of Yahweh, the Almighty, the Creator, proclaimed to us. What an incredible privilege to be given insight into the character of the Almighty. How comforting it would be to learn that he is a loving God, full of mercy and compassion, but towards those who truly long to know him and to serve him. So in this wonderful event, we see that God not only revealed to Moses his name, 
but also his eternal character and purpose. And these two go hand in hand, don't they? Now, this is the verse that we're all very, very familiar with, and I'm sure we can quote it backwards, forwards, in our sleep, etc. And that's Numbers 14, verse 21. But truly, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of Yahweh. And it is a wonderful verse. But you know, often we stop at that point. And we don't go on to verse 22. And verse 22 is the one that holds so much importance for us this morning. Look what it says. All the people have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness. And yet have tempted me now these ten times and have not obeyed me. What did the people see in the wilderness? What was it that they witnessed of God's glory? Well, I'm sure it would have been a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud in front and behind them. But it was so much more than that, wasn't it? It was his actual character at work in the great miracles that, he, that uh, God declared and did for them. That would declare his love for them, his patience for them, despite their murmuring, his abundant provision for them, for their daily needs. These were the things that declared God's glory and his character. And the people were, were, were blessed to be able to see those things firsthand. And yet they still murmured. They truly didn't know God. Now we might think, well, what are the 12 disciples? Well, in the New Testament record, there's one of the disciples who also wants to, just like Moses, wants to know God, to know more about God. And so he asks the Lord Jesus for help. The record is recorded in John 14, and I'm just going to read two verses. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be content. And Jesus replies, have I been with you for so long, and you have not known me, Philip? The person who has seen me, sorry, the person who has seen the Father, let's try that again, the person who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I think that was quite a strong rebuke for Philip there. But clearly the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't suggesting that he shared the same physical appearance as God. Instead, he was that living manifestation of the character of God. And brothers and sisters, if we've come to know God, to truly know God, we cannot fail to see God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the things that Christ did, in the things that Christ spoke, in the things that Christ taught, to hear and to learn about God, we have to listen to and to believe on his son, the Lord Jesus. I mean, where else can we learn about God other than from the scriptures? And I want you to ponder these verses in Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How are they to call on one they have not believed in? And how are they to believe in one they have not heard of? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? But we must stop to ponder the wonderful privilege we have that God had prepared faithful apostles and disciples who would go out into the world, their lives at risk, to spread his word, to cause it to be written and recorded, that even this morning we can open its pages and read and hear and understand the words that as Paul continues in our dialogue, consequently faith comes from what is heard. What is heard comes from the preached word of Christ. And that's the blessing that each one of us has this morning, brothers and sisters. Now, if, we, if you want to turn up with me to um, the first letter of John, please. 
There's some wonderful words that are recorded for us about the Lord Jesus Christ and his manifestation of the character of God. We read in verse 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, that glory of the Lord Jesus Christ was not to be seen in his outward appearance, was it? But rather in his beautiful character, full of grace and of truth. And we remember the words of Isaiah very well, don't we? In chapter 53, he has no form or comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It wasn't his outward appearance. It was the reflection, the manifestation of God's character. We see Jesus reflect, reflecting and manifesting God's own character, merciful, gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And throughout his ministry, the Lord showed this character of his Father to the world. Back in John's Gospel, in chapter 17, we read, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own, thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, thou gavest in me, and they have kept thy word. What a powerful thought. The Lord Jesus Christ says there, I have manifested thy name. Yahweh Elohim, I will be who I will be. This wonderful character. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ was able to manifest in his life. And in many places in scripture, we're told that God is setting apart a people for his name. They are to be a chosen people. A people who will show forth the same virtues, the same characteristics of the one who has called them out of darkness. Acts 15 tells us that Simeon or Simon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. If we don't know God, how can we be a people for his name? And in 1 Peter chapter 2, we're reminded you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people of his own, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, that's what we're called to do, brothers and sisters. We've been taken out of the darkness of the Gentile world into the light of God to proclaim his virtues in our lives, the same characteristics that make up his name. You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. You were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to keep away from fleshly lusts that do battle against the soul. Maintain good conduct among the Gentiles so that they now malign you as wrongdoers that they may see your good deeds and glorify God when Jesus appears. How do, we main good, how do we maintain good conduct? Other than by manifesting the qualities of our Heavenly Father. So if we're hoping, if we're praying, if we're seeking for salvation and eternal life, we have to show that we know God and the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We have to develop the same characters in our lives as the characters that we've read of this morning. That we too manifest 
that name in our actions and in our way of life. The Apostle Paul exhorts us very fittingly, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, being jealous of one another. Isn't this list exactly the attributes of the divine character of Yahweh? Those things that we should be trying to perfect in our mortal lives. And the exhortation in Second Peter is very strong and clear for us. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence, work at it, make every effort to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail. So as we come to remember the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, in these emblems of bread and of wine, we need to be very mindful of that great example that our Lord has left for us to follow. If we are truly followers of his, then we should be likewise followers of Yahweh himself. If in this life we strive to be more like him, and more like the character of our Lord, that we might know and manifest his character. We won't get it right to side of the kingdom. We won't get it perfectly correct. But we need to make every effort to do our best because that's what is pleasing to God. When we fail, while well, we have the covering of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the forgiveness of sin. As we remember our Lord, we should be very grateful of what God has done through our Lord Jesus to bring us unto him. That we've been reconciled to God through Christ. That we are called our people for his name. The letter to the Hebrews reminds us very aptly, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. See, that's what God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought many sons and daughters unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. I want you to open to the book of Hosea, please. Because there's some wonderful words of encouragement there for us this morning. So Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to consider the first, the first three verses. Isaiah 6, come on, let's return to Yahweh. He himself has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bandage our wounds. He will restore us in a very short time. He will heal us in a little while so that we may live in his presence. So let us search for him, brothers and sisters. Let us seek to know Yahweh. He will come to our rescue as certainly as the appearance of the dawn, as certainly as the winter rain comes, as certainly as the spring rain that waters the land. God's ultimate purpose to fill this earth with his glory will take place, brothers and sisters. The choice is ours if we want to be part of that, that glorious multitude that the book of Revelation speaks about. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, with them a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. 
I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Let us our hope, brothers and sisters, that we too might be part of that multitudinous throng that were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. That is our hope, brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, who have symbolically, who have symbolically God's name written on their foreheads, that we are a people from reading his word to come to know and to follow obediently his ways, to show our love and to show our appreciation and our reverence for him by trying to develop his character. You see, God has said for us, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. When God's kingdom is established on the earth, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the character and the behavior of God's people will ultimately display his glory, won't it? His name will be continuously proclaimed. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. Men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be Yahweh Elohim, the Ael of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen.